Epic of Gilgamesh, Wikipedia Audio The Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic poem from ancient Mesopotamia that is often regarded as the earliest surviving great work of literature. The literary history of Gilgamesh begins with five Sumerian poems about Bilgamesh, king of Uruk, dating from the third dynasty of Ur. These independent stories were later used as source material for a combined epic. The first surviving version of this combined epic, known as the Old Babylonian Version, dates to the 18th century BC and is titled after its incipit, Shtur Eli Shar. Only a few tablets of it have survived. The later standard version dates from the 13th to the 10th centuries BC and bears the incipit Shanakba Muru. Approximately two-thirds of this longer, 12-tablet version have been recovered. Some of the best copies were discovered in the library ruins of the 7th century BC Assyrian king Ashurbanipal. The first half of the story discusses Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and Enkidu, a wild man created by the gods to stop Gilgamesh from oppressing the people of Uruk. After Enkidu becomes civilized through sexual initiation with a harlot, he travels to Uruk, where he challenges Gilgamesh to a test of strength. Gilgamesh wins and the two become friends. Together, they make a six-day journey to the legendary Cedar Forest, where they plan to slay the guardian, Humbaba the Terrible, and cut down the sacred cedar. Later they kill the Bull of Heaven, which the goddess Ishtar sends to punish Gilgamesh for spurning her advances. As a punishment for these actions, the gods sentence Enkidja to death. In the second half of the epic, Distress about Enkidu's death causes Gilgamesh to undertake a long and perilous journey to discover the secret of eternal life. He eventually learns that life, which you look for, you will never find. For when the gods created man, they let death be his share, and life withheld in their own hands. However, because of his great building projects, his account of Siduri's advice, and what the immortal man at Napishtim told him about the great flood, Gilgamesh's fame survived his death. His story has been translated into many languages, and in recent years has featured in works of popular fiction. History Distinct sources exist from over a 2,000-year time frame. The earliest Sumerian poems are now generally considered to be distinct stories, rather than parts of a single epic, 45 they date from as early as the 3rd dynasty of Ur, 4142 the Old Babylonian Tablets, 45 are the earliest surviving tablets for a single epic of Gilgamesh narrative. The older Old Babylonian tablets and later Akkadian version are important sources for modern translations, with the earlier texts mainly used to fill in gaps in the later texts. Although several revised versions based on new discoveries have been published, the epic remains incomplete. Analysis of the Old Babylonian text has been used to reconstruct possible earlier forms of the Epic of Gilgamesh. The most recent Akkadian version, also referred to as the Standard Version, consisting of 12 tablets, was edited by Sinlai Kunani and was found in the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. The Epic of Gilgamesh was discovered by Hormuzd Rasim in 1853. The central character of Gilgamesh was initially reintroduced to the world as Izdubar, before the cuneiform logographs in his name could be pronounced accurately. The first modern translation was published in the early 1870s by George Smith. Smith then made further discoveries of texts on his later expeditions, which culminated in his final translation which is given in his book The Chaldean Account of Genesis. The most definitive modern translation is a two-volume critical work by Andrew George, 
published by Oxford University Press in 2003. A book review by the Cambridge scholar, Eleanor Robson, claims that George's is the most significant critical work on Gilgamesh in the last 70 years. George discusses the state of the surviving material, and provides a tablet-by-tablet -tablet exegesis, with a dual-language side-by-side translation. In 2004, Stephen Mitchell supplied a controversial version that takes many liberties with the text and includes modernized allusions and commentary relating to the Iraq War of 2003. The first direct Arabic translation from the original tablets was made in the 1960s by the Iraqi archaeologist Taha Bakir. The discovery of artifacts associated with Enmebaraj C. of Kish, mentioned in the legends as the father of one of Gilgamesh's adversaries, has lent credibility to the historical existence of Gilgamesh, 4041. From the diverse sources found, Two main versions of the epic have been partially reconstructed, the standard Akkadian version, or he who saw the deep, and the old Babylonian version, or surpassing all other kings. Five earlier Sumerian poems about Gilgamesh have been partially recovered, some with primitive versions of specific episodes in the Akkadian version, others with unrelated stories. The standard version was discovered by Hormuzd Rasim in the library of Ashur Bani Paul in Nineveh in 1853. It was written in a dialect of Akkadian that was used for literary purposes. This version was compiled by Sin Lykunani sometime between 1300 and 1000 BC from earlier texts. The standard Akkadian version has different opening words or incipit, from the older version. The older version begins with the words surpassing all other kings, while the standard version has he who saw the deep, deep referring to the mysteries of the information brought back by Gilgamesh from his meeting with Utanapishti about Ea, the fountain of wisdom. Gilgamesh was given knowledge of how to worship the gods, why death was ordained for human beings what makes a good king, and how to live a good life. The story of Utnapishtim, the hero of the flood myth, can also be found in the Babylonian epic of Atrahasis. The twelfth tablet is a sequel to the original eleven, and was probably added at a later date. It bears little relation to the well-crafted eleven-tablet epic. The lines at the beginning of the first tablet are quoted at the end of the eleventh tablet, giving it circularity and finality. Tablet 12 is a near copy of an earlier Sumerian tale, a prequel, in which Gilgamesh sends Enkidu to retrieve some objects of his from the underworld, and he returns in the form of a spirit to relate the nature of the underworld to Gilgamesh. Versions this summary is based on Andrew George's translation. The story introduces Gilgamesh, king of Uruk. Gilgamesh, two-thirds god and one-third man, is oppressing his people, who cry out to the gods for help. For the young women of Uruk this oppression takes the form of a droid du seigneur, or a lord's right, to sleep with brides on their wedding night. For the young men it is conjectured that Gilgamesh exhausts them through games, tests of strength, or perhaps forced labor on building projects. The gods respond to the people's pleas by creating an equal to Gilgamesh who will be able to stop his oppression. This is the primitive man, Inkiju, who is covered in hair and lives in the wild with the animals. He is spotted by a trapper whose livelihood is being ruined because Enkidu is uprooting his traps. The trapper tells the sun god Shamash about the man, and it is arranged for Enkidu to be seduced by Shamhut, a temple prostitute, his first step towards being tamed. 
After six days and seven nights of continuous lovemaking she takes Inkiju to a shepherd's camp to learn how to be civilized. Gilgamesh, meanwhile, has been having dreams about the imminent arrival of a beloved new companion. Shamhut brings Inkiju to the shepherd's camp, where he is introduced to a human diet and becomes the night watchman. Learning from a passing stranger about Gilgamesh's treatment of new brides, Inkiju is incensed and travels to Uruk to intervene at a wedding. When Gilgamesh attempts to visit the wedding chamber, Inkiju blocks his way, and they fight. After a fierce battle, Inkiju acknowledges Gilgamesh's superior strength and they become friends. Gilgamesh proposes a journey to the cedar forest to slay the monstrous demigod Humbaba in order to gain fame and renown. Despite warnings from Inkiju and the Council of Elders, Gilgamesh is not deterred. The elders give Gilgamesh advice for his journey. Gilgamesh visits his mother, the goddess Ninsen, who seeks the support and protection of the sun god Shamash for their adventure. Ninsen adopts Inkiju as her son, and Gilgamesh leaves instructions for the governance of Uruk in his absence. Gilgamesh and Inkiju journey to the cedar forest. Every few days they camp on a mountain, and perform a dream ritual. Gilgamesh has five terrifying dreams about falling mountains, thunderstorms, wild bulls, and a thunderbird that breathes fire. Despite similarities between his dream figures and earlier descriptions of Humbaba, Inkiju interprets these dreams as good omens, and denies that the frightening images represent the forest guardian. As they approach the cedar mountain, they hear Humbaba bellowing, and have to encourage each other not to be afraid. The heroes enter the cedar forest. Humbaba, the guardian of the cedar forest, insults and threatens them. He accuses Inkiju of betrayal, and vows to disembowel Gilgamesh and feed his flesh to the birds. Gilgamesh is afraid but with some encouraging words from Inkiju the battle commences. The mountains quake with the tumult and the sky turns black. The god Shamash sends thirteen wines to bind Humbaba, and he is captured. The monster pleads for his life, and Gilgamesh pities him. He offers Gilgamesh to be king of the forest, he will cut the trees for him, and be his slave. Inkiju, however, is enraged and asks Gilgamesh to kill the beast, because he knows that Humbaba is lying. Humbaba curses them both and Gilgamesh dispatches him with a blow to the neck. The two heroes cut down many cedars, including a gigantic tree that Inkiju plans to fashion into a gate for the temple of Enlil. They build a raft and return home along the Euphrates with the giant tree and the head of Humbaba. Gilgamesh rejects the advances of the goddess Ishtar because of her mistreatment of previous lovers like Dumuzi. Ishtar asks her father Anu to send Gugalana, the bull of heaven, to avenge her. When Anu rejects her complaints, Ishtar threatens to raise the dead who will outnumber the living and devour them. Anu becomes frightened, and gives in to her. Ishtar leads Gugalana to Uruk, and it causes widespread devastation. It lowers the level of the Euphrates River, and dries up the marshes. It opens up huge pits that swallow 300 men. Without any divine assistance, Inkiju and Gilgamesh attack and slay it, and offer up its heart to Shamash. When Ishtar cries out, Inkiju hurls one of the hindquarters of the bull at her. The city of Uruk celebrates, but Inkiju has an ominous dream about his future failure. Standard Akkadian Version Content of the Standard Version Tablets in Inkiju's dream, the gods decide that one of the heroes must die because they killed Humbaba and Gugalana. 
despite the protestations of Shamash, Inkiju is marked for death. Inkiju curses the great door he has fashioned for Enlil's temple. He also curses the trapper and Shamhat for removing him from the wild. Shamash reminds Inkiju of how Shamhat fed and clothed him, and introduced him to Gilgamesh. Shamash tells him that Gilgamesh will bestow great honors upon him at his funeral, and will wander into the wild consumed with grief. Inkiju regrets his curses and blesses Shamhat. In a second dream, however, he sees himself being taken captive to the netherworld by a terrifying angel of death. The underworld is a house of dust and darkness whose inhabitants eat clay, and are clothed in bird feathers, supervised by terrifying beings. For twelve days, Inkiju's condition worsens. Finally, after a lament that he could not meet a heroic death in battle, he dies. Tablet 1 Tablet 2 Tablet 3 Tablet 4 Tablet 5 Gilgamesh delivers a lamentation for Inkiju, in which he calls upon mountains, forests, fields, rivers, wild animals, and all of Uruk to mourn for his friend. Recalling their adventures together, Gilgamesh tears at his hair and clothes in grief. He commissions a funerary statue, and provides grave gifts from his treasury to ensure that Ankiju has a favorable reception in the realm of the dead. A great banquet is held where the treasures are offered to the gods of the netherworld. Just before a break in the text there is a suggestion that a river is being dammed, indicating a burial in a river bed, as in the corresponding Sumerian poem, The Death of Gilgamesh. Tablet 9 opens with Gilgamesh roaming the wild wearing animal skins, grieving for Inkiju. Fearful of his own death, he decides to seek Utnapishtim, and learn the secret of eternal life. Among the few survivors of the Great Flood, Utnapishtim and his wife are the only humans to have been granted immortality by the gods. Gilgamesh crosses a mountain pass at night and encounters a pride of lions. Before sleeping he prays for protection to the moon god Sin. Then, waking from an encouraging dream, he kills the lions and uses their skins for clothing. After a long and perilous journey, Gilgamesh arrives at the twin peaks of Mount Mashu at the end of the earth. He comes across a tunnel, which no man has ever entered, guarded by two terrible scorpion men. After questioning him and recognizing his semi-divine nature, they allow him to enter it, and he passes under the mountains along the road of the Sunday. In complete darkness he follows the road for twelve double hours, managing to complete the trip before the sun catches up with him. He arrives at the Garden of the Gods, a paradise full of jewel-laden trees. Gilgamesh meets alewife Siduri, who assumes that he is a murderer or thief because of his disheveled appearance. Gilgamesh tells her about the purpose of his journey. She attempts to dissuade him from his quest, but sends him to Urshanabi the ferryman, who will help him cross the sea to Utnapishtim. Gilgamesh, out of spontaneous rage, destroys the stone giants that live with Urshanabi. He tells him his story, but when he asks for his help, Urshanabi informs him that he has just destroyed the only creatures who can cross the waters of death which are deadly to the touch. Urshanabi instructs Gilgamesh to cut down 120 trees and fashion them into punting poles. When they reach the island where Utnapishtim lives, Gilgamesh recounts his story, asking him for his help. Utnapishtim reprimands him, declaring that fighting the common fate of humans is futile and diminishes life's joys. Tablet 6 Gilgamesh observes that Utnapishtim seems no different from himself, 
and asks him how he obtained his immortality. Utnapishtim explains that the gods decided to send a great flood. To save Utnapishtim the god Ea told him to build a boat. He gave him precise dimensions, and it was sealed with pitch and bitumen. His entire family went aboard together with his craftsmen and all the animals of the field. A violent storm then arose which caused the terrified gods to retreat to the heavens. Ishtar lamented the wholesale destruction of humanity, and the other gods wept beside her. The storm lasted six days and nights, after which all the human beings turned to clay. Utnapishtim weeps when he sees the destruction. His boat lodges on a mountain, and he releases a dove, a swallow, and a raven. When the raven fails to return, he opens the ark and frees its inhabitants. Utnapishtim offers a sacrifice to the gods, who smell the sweet savor and gather around. Ishtar vows that just as she will never forget the brilliant necklace that hangs around her neck, she will always remember this time. When Enlil arrives, angry that there are survivors, she condemns him for instigating the flood. Ea also castigates him for sending a disproportionate punishment. Enlil blesses Utnapishtim and his wife, and rewards them with eternal life. This account matches the flood story that concludes the epic of Atrahasis. The main point seems to be that when Enlil granted eternal life it was a unique gift. As if to demonstrate this point, Utnapishtim challenges Gilgamesh to stay awake for six days and seven nights. Gilgamesh falls asleep, and Utnapishtim instructs his wife to bake a loaf of bread on each of the days he is asleep so that he cannot deny his failure to keep awake. Gilgamesh, who is seeking to overcome death, cannot even conquer sleep. After instructing Urshanabi the ferryman to wash Gilgamesh, and clothe him in royal robes, they depart for Uruk. As they are leaving, Utnapishtim's wife asks her husband to offer a parting gift. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that at the bottom of the sea there lives a box thorn like plant that will make him young again. Gilgamesh, by binding stones to his feet so he can walk on the bottom, manages to obtain the plant. Gilgamesh proposes to investigate if the plant has the hypothesized rejuvenation ability by testing it on an old man once he returns to Uruk. There is a plant that looks like a box thorn, it has prickles like a dog rosse, and will prick one who plucks it. But if you can possess this plant, you'll be again as you were in your youth. This plant, Durshanabi, is the plant of heartbeat, with it a man can regain his vigor. To you ruck the sheepfold I will take it, to an ancient I will feed some and put the plant to the test. 98. Unfortunately, when Gilgamesh stops to bathe, it is stolen by a serpent, who sheds its skin as it departs. Gilgamesh weeps at the futility of his efforts, because he has now lost all chance of immortality. He returns to Uruk, where the sight of its massive walls prompts him to praise this enduring work to Urshanabi. This tablet is mainly an Akkadian translation of an earlier Sumerian poem, Gilgamesh, and the Netherworld, although it has been suggested that it is derived from an unknown version of that story. 42 The contents of this last tablet are inconsistent with previous ones. Inkiju is still alive, despite having died earlier in the epic. Because of this, its lack of integration with the other tablets, and the fact that it is almost a copy of an earlier version, it has been referred to as an inorganic appendage to the epic. Alternatively, it has been suggested that its purpose, though crudely handled, is to explain to Gilgamesh the various fates of the dead in the afterlife and in an awkward attempt to bring closure, 
it both connects the Gilgamesh of the epic with the Gilgamesh who is the king of the netherworld, and is a dramatic capstone whereby the twelve tablet epic ends on one and the same theme, that of seeing, with which it began. Tablet 7 Gilgamesh complains to Enkidja that various of his possessions have fallen into the underworld. Enkidju offers to bring them back. Delighted, Gilgamesh tells Enkidju what he must and must not do in the underworld if he is to return. Enkidju does everything which he was told not to do. The underworld keeps him. Gilgamesh prays to the gods to give him back his friend. Enlil and Soon don't reply, but Ea and Shamash decide to help. Shamash makes a crack in the earth, and Enkidju's ghost jumps out of it. The tablet ends with Gilgamesh questioning Enkidju about what he has seen in the underworld. This version of the epic, called in some fragments surpassing all other kings, is composed of tablets and fragments from diverse origins and states of conservation. 10126 It remains incomplete in its majority with several tablets missing and big lacunae in those found. They are named after their current location or the place where they were found. Tablet 8 Surpassing all other kings Tablet 2, greatly correlates with Tablets I2 of the standard version. Gilgamesh tells his mother Ninsen about two dreams he had. His mother explains that they mean that a new companion will soon arrive at Uruk. In the meanwhile the wild Enkidju and the priestess are making love. She tames him in company of the shepherds by offering him bread and beer. Enkidju helps the shepherds by guarding the sheep. They travel to Uruk to confront Gilgamesh and stop his abuses. Enkidju and Gilgamesh battle but Gilgamesh breaks off the fight. Enkidju praises Gilgamesh. Surpassing all other kings Tablet 3, partially matches Tablets 2-3 of the standard version. For reasons unknown Enkidju is in a sad mood. In order to cheer him up Gilgamesh suggests going to the pine forest to cut down trees and kill Humbaba. Enkidju protests, as he knows Huverwa and is aware of his power. Gilgamesh talks Enkidju into it with some words of encouragement, but Enkidju remains reluctant. They prepare, and call for the elders. The elders also protest, but after Gilgamesh talks to them, they agree to let him go. After Gilgamesh asks his god for protection and both equip, they leave with the elders' blessing and counsel. Tablet 9 Tablet 10 Tablet 11 Possibly another version of the contents of the Yale tablet, practically irrecoverable. In the journey to the cedar forest and Huverwa, Enkidju interprets one of Gilgamesh's dreams. Fragments from two different versions slash tablets tell how Enkidju interprets one of Gilgamesh's dreams on the way to the forest of cedar and their conversation when entering the forest. After defeating Huverwa, Gilgamesh refrains from slaying him, and urges Enkidju to hunt Huverwa's seven auras. Enkidju convinces him to smite their enemy. After killing Huverwa and the auras, they chop down part of the forest and discover the god's secret abode. The rest of the tablet is broken. The auras are not referred to in the standard version, but are in one of the Sumerian poems. Partially overlapping the felling of the trees from the Ishtali tablet. Partially overlapping the standard version tablets 9x. Gilgamesh mourns the death of Enkidju wandering in his quest for immortality. Gilgamesh argues with Shamash about the futility of his quest. After a lacuna, Gilgamesh talks to Siduri about his quest and his journey to meet Utnapishtim. Siduri attempts to dissuade Gilgamesh in his quest for immortality, 
urging him to be content with the simple pleasures of life. After one more lacuna, Gilgamesh smashes the stone ones and talks to the ferryman Urshanabi. After a short discussion, Sir Sunabu asks him to carve three hundred oars so that they may cross the waters of death without needing the stone ones. The rest of the tablet is missing. The text on the old Babylonian Meissner fragment has been used to reconstruct possible earlier forms of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it has been suggested that a prior form of the story earlier even than that preserved on the old Babylonian fragment may well have ended with Siduri sending Gilgamesh back to Uruk. And Utnapistam was not originally part of the tale. There are five extant Gilgamesh stories in the form of older poems in Sumerian, 141-208 These probably circulated independently, rather than being in the form of a unified epic. Some of the names of the main characters in these poems differ slightly from later Akkadian names, for example, Bilgamesh is written instead of Gilgamesh and there are some differences in the underlying stories such as the fact that Enkidu is Gilgamesh's servant in the Sumerian version. Various themes, plot elements, and characters in the Epic of Gilgamesh have counterparts in the Hebrew Bible notably, the accounts of the Garden of Eden, the advice from Ecclesiastes, and the Genesis flood narrative. The parallels between the stories of Enkidu slash Shamhut and Adam slash Eve have been long recognized by scholars. In both, a man is created from the soil by a god, and lives in a natural setting amongst the animals. He is introduced to a woman who tempts him. In both stories the man accepts food from the woman, covers his nakedness, and must leave his former realm unable to return. The presence of a snake that steals a plant of immortality from the hero later in the epic is another point of similarity. Several scholars suggest direct borrowing of Siduri's advice by the author of Ecclesiastes. A rare proverb about the strength of a triple-stranded rope, a triple-stranded rope is not easily broken, is common to both books. Andrew George submits that the Genesis flood narrative matches that in Gilgamesh so closely that few doubt that it derives from a Mesopotamian account. What is particularly noticeable is the way the Genesis flood story follows the Gilgamesh flood tale point by point and in the same order, even when the story permits other alternatives. In a 2001 Torah commentary released on behalf of the conservative movement of Judaism, Rabbinic scholar Robert Wexler stated, The most likely assumption we can make is that both Genesis and Gilgamesh drew their material from a common tradition about the flood that existed in Mesopotamia. These stories then diverged in the retelling. Zayasudra, Utnapishtim, and Noah are the respective heroes of the Sumerian, Akkadian and Biblical flood legends of the ancient Near East. Matthias Hentze suggests that Nebuchadnezzar's madness in the biblical book of Daniel draws on the Epic of Gilgamesh. He claims that the author uses elements from the description of Enkidu to paint a sarcastic and mocking portrait of the king of Babylon. While not directly discussed in the epic itself, many of the characters in the epic also have myths associated with them with close biblical parallels, notably Ninti. The Sumerian goddess of life, was created from Enki's rib to heal him after he had eaten forbidden flowers. Some scholars suggest that this served as the basis for the story of Eve created from Adam's rib in the book of Genesis. Esther J. Hamari, in Echoes of Gilgamesh in Jacob's Story, also claims that the myth of Jacob and Esau is paralleled with the wrestling match between Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Numerous scholars have drawn attention to various themes, episodes, and verses, indicating that the Epic of Gilgamesh had a substantial influence on both of the epic poems ascribed to Homer. These influences are detailed by Martin Litchfield West in The East Face of Helican, 
West Asiatic elements in Greek poetry and myth. According to Tsvia Bus of Brandeis University, the poem combines the power and tragedy of the Iliad with the wanderings and marvels of the Odyssey. It is a work of adventure, but is no less a meditation on some fundamental issues of human existence. The Epic of Gilgamesh has inspired many works of literature, art, and music, as Theodore Zyolkowski points out in his book Gilgamesh Among Us, Modern Encounters with the Ancient Epic. It was only after the First World War that the Gilgamesh epic reached a wide audience, and only after the Second World War that it began to feature in a variety of genres. Tablet 12 Old Babylonian Versions Pennsylvania Tablet Yale Tablet Philadelphia Fragment Nippur School Tablet Telharmal Tablets Ishchali Tablet Partial Fragment in Baghdad Sipar Tablet Sumerian Poems Later Influence Relationship to the Bible Garden of Eden Advice from Ecclesiastes Noah's Flood Other Biblical Parallels Influence on Homer In Popular Culture Citations Bibliography Translations Versions 2 Analysis <laughs>